Hello everyone, welcome to the last part of this lecture series. It's the history of the Latin alphabet, uh, part 6, and we'll talk about modern types and their influences. We'll talk about the revival of the sans serif. Uh, last time we looked at the grotesques, um, the sans serifs from the 19th and early 20th century, and they weren't really being used for anything else other than big headlines, and they were sort of being shunned by fine book printers. And after World War II, a lot of improvements happened in the world of sans serif. And so, as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of things that are going on after the World War has ended. And the idea of a typeface family to have a lot of different styles um, with a family of consistent related designs happened. And Unibert from the Swiss designer Adrian Frutiger uh, was very, very popular. Um, it, was, it was released at that very end of the metal type era. And it was based on uh, German type bases such as Accidents Grotesque. And it just had so many different styles that was very, very surprising for people of this time. And 1957 is a big year for Swiss type bases because Helvetica is also born. It was originally named Neue Haas Grotesque. And um, only three years after it's released as Neue Haas Grotesque, Linotype licenses it, renames a Helvetica, and markets it really, really heavily to the public. Um, it's an instant success, it's very heavily marketed, and it has a movie <laughs> um, named Helvetica, of course, and this is a great feature-length documentary about uh, Helvetica and the impact that has had on global culture by Gary Hustowit. And Gary Hustowit is actually streaming his films for free during the COVID-19 crisis, so if you are watching this video when it's still streaming for free, definitely go see it, even if you're watching it later, it's still very much worth seeing. Um, there's been a lot of developments that has happened since Helvetica was filmed, of course. Um, I'm recording this lecture in 2020, so it's been a very long time. But a lot of the lessons that is um, pointed out in uh, the use of Helvetica here is uh, very applicable to our modern times as well. The German calligrapher Hermann Zoff sort of rises to the scene in 1950 with Palatino. Um, and Palatino, if you remember, was like the writing master from the Italian um, writing manual era. And we'll see a lot of Hermann Zoff's work here. Um, he's a figure that's contributed so much um, in terms of work to the world of calligraphy and type. And here is the legendary bank note uh, from Hermann Zoff. Uh, here we see that he's uh, sketched his um, original designs for Optima on a bank note here on a vacation trip that he had. And Optima is still very much used today for its elegance um, and humanist design, uh, although it's a sans serif. So this is like a humanist sans serif where you can see the flared edges. It has a very classical proportion. So if you remember the proportions of Roman inscriptional capitals where it has a very round O and a narrow E and S and so forth like that, portion is very well, well kept here. And here on the lower left side, you see um, a photo of Hermann Zoff and his partner Gudrun Zoff von Hess. And Gudrun Zoff was a very, very talented calligrapher and designer of her own accord as well. We see that Gudrun Zoff designed this Hess Antiqua here. And this is very remarkable because Gudrun learned how to punch cut in the late 1940s, which is very remarkable because there were no woman punch cutters at that time. Um, she learned how to cut the metal type and she cut Hess Antiqua. And it was only in this uh, metal type format for a long time before it was uh, digitized pretty, uh, pretty fairly recently. And here that we see that she was uh, using this in her book binding, where she was very well known for these like um, gold stamps that she put on with like hot uh, metal. Uh, uh, letter punches. Um, and when this was uh, revived for a digital uh, version of it, like um, there's a lot of documentation about like how like Hessen Tico was meant to be um, pressed into surfaces and how like it just can't be uh, taken just as like the design of like the metal design itself because like it, it was also accounting for the fact that like there would be like a little bit of um, impression that was. Uh, going to be seen along with it when it was engraved on a leather binding. She also designed Diotina for Stempel later in 1951, and it's just, um, just so beautiful when it's set in text. 
And it seems like you've been sort of neglecting the written letters as opposed to like the, the metal cut or like the typeset letters. But calligraphy has been having a revival like this entire time. And we'll see a, a lot of the same names that are mentioned here. Because there is this idea of like a person who could do lettering, calligraphy, bookbinds, and printing like all in the same one person. And of course, like William Morris uh, of the Arts and Crafts Movement comes up again. Um, we were talking about how William Morris really admired the medieval way of making manuscripts. Um, he was very much against like the mechanicized process that was taking over the art, the arts and crafts world at the time. Like he really did not appreciate how a lot of these like crafts were being turned into like uh, mechanicized processes that sort of left the human hand out of it. And uh, he, he teaches himself um, how to write uh, calligraphy from uh, writing manuals from the Renaissance. And he like learns the art of gilding to use in his own manuscripts. And he um, just produces these very, very amazing and beautiful handwritten manuscripts alongside his printed works as well. And if you remember Edward Johnson from his um, London Underground Types, uh, he was a very big figure in the revival of the calligraphy movement. Um, he also researches medieval and Renaissance techniques. He was very much inspired by William Morris. And he makes this very famous foundational alphabet that you see here. Uh, it was based on a, um, a manuscript called the Ramsey Psalter that we'll see in one second. And he's very, very influential because he teaches a lot of students and his uh, book that's published um, that's named uh, Writing, Illuminating and Lettering. Uh, it's, it's very, very inspiring for a lot of people to learn like the craft of um, letters, um, making them by hand, uh, writing, calligraphy, and all these traditions that were sort of lost before his time. Um, if there was a tradition of calligraphy that was before him, it was sort of lost uh, before him and that he had to sort of relearn the process throughout all these documentations, um, self-studying, and uh, it's very astounding that he was able to sort of recreate an entire school of calligraphy based on his research. And this is the, uh, the famous Harley MS-2904, where he bases his foundational hand on. So meanwhile, in Austria and Germany, they have their own calligraphic renaissance. Uh, Rudolf van Larsch was very influential when he was teaching in Vienna. He, teach, um, he taught about like the way that letters were made with uh, tools and how tools had effect on letters. And he teaches like the language and materials. And you can see that he made a lot of um, uh, experimental letter forms, as you see here also. Rudolf Koch is another um, famous name who designed Cabell that we've seen before. He was considered, or is considered, the father of modern calligraphy along with Johnston. And I find him very inspiring in the fact that he could use almost every kind of tool and material. He's using pens, metal, fabric, wood blocks, paper, everything that he can get his hands on. And he just seems to sort of impart this like style, um, no matter what uh, material that he gets his hands on. He produces a lot of work and he designed typefaces primarily for the Kingsborough Foundry in Offenbach. And he was a very religious figure as well. So you can see a lot of his work is dedicated to um, God. Um, along in his uh, very famous roster of students, like it includes like Berthold Balpi, um, Warren Chapel, um, a lot of these figures that he influences, like go on to have um, very, very illustrious careers of their own. Um, and another side story is that like he also made Neuland um, because he wanted to have a black letter that had a Roman style. Um, and it's later being used for logos for like, you know, like Lion King or Jurassic Park or like things that uh, might not have to do with like German values, so to speak. Um, the punches for New Orleans are very beautiful and very unique in the fact that like it was cut by Koch himself, but without any previous design. Like he was just picking up the metal punches and sort of cutting them. So each size is uh, very unique in the sense that he was uh, changing the forms as he was cutting them for different sizes. And so, like, um, this is, like, the baggage that Nolan has. So, like, although it was originally intended as a form of black letter that expresses, um, you know, German qualities, like, in our modern days, like, it sort of has to be, you know, it just sort of has, like, the, um, the label and baggage of, you know, being used to 
sort of like signify like exo- exotic or primitive or something like African. Um, you know, it's like that's like the burden um, and baggage that New Orleans has for our current day. Alfred Fairbank is another notable British calligrapher who was very instrumental in the Italic revival. So his book, A Handwriting Manual, uh, was very influential in the way that uh, handwriting was being taught in British schools back in his day, um, and probably still. And like he had one typeface that was made. Um, it was uh, modeled on Erigi's handwriting, and um, although he meant it as an independent drawing, it sort of um, you know, was given to monotype, um, and then like it got branded as Bembo Condensed Italic and released with Bembo, uh, which um, Alfred Fairbank understandably had a lot of problems with. So here we hear about these offs again. Uh, Herman Zoff created this very amazing book called Pen Engraver, or Federal and Stickle, in 1950. Uh, this is like the same year that his Techies Palatino was published, and it really put him on the map. And uh, what I find very amazing is that, like, he designed all of these plates when he was in his mid um, 20s, although it wasn't printed until uh, maybe like five or, you know, some years later, um, maybe 10 years later, seven years later, something like that. Um, and it was cut by August, August Rosenberger, who Herman Zoff always credits very heavily um, because, as you remember, like, the engravers were like the instrumental part of translating a calligraphist's writing into the metal plates that they would be printed in. And if you remember um, how many people are self-taught in this time, like it's it's so remarkable. And Herman Zoff is another one of those characters where he was self-taught um, learning from books and manuscripts. And it's just so astounding like how talented he was, even at a younger age. And this is the largest calligraphic piece that he ever worked on which is the preamble of the Charter of the United uh, Nations. Uh, It's written in French, English, Spanish, and Russian. Um, So this is a Cyrillic script here. It's now at the Megan Library in New York. George Salter is a well-known character in the world of cover design and calligraphy. He was originally German, and he emigrated to the U.S. He taught at the Cooper Union in New York City, and so he inspired an entire generation of lettering artists um, who later went into commercial lettering, and so like lettered for books, um, and so forth. Ernst Schneidler is a character that you might have heard of because he was such an influential teacher um, in Germany. He's regarded as the founder of the Stuttgart School, and like his student roster also includes like Emma Reiner, Georg Trump, Walter Brudy, Rudolf Schneemann, Albert Pupper, a lot of famous um, students to come out and also deserve lectures in their own right. Um, another note that I have to say is that, like, on his Wikipedia page, like, he does have, like, the note that, like, he was classified as a follower during the, deno- the, the denazification process of his whole journey. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, take what you will, but I, I think it's important to sort of, like, note the um, characteristics of these people. Um, although I guess, like, none really rival Eric Gill in terms of um, moral failures, I suppose. Uh, okay, so, like, here's Albert Menhart. Um, who is my uh, favorite Czech designer, uh, influenced by uh, the calligrapher Karl Roars, of course, um, who is very influential to me. Um, so Aldrich Menhart was very concerned with finding a national character in his types. So if you see here, like he has a very, very strong calligraphic influence on his types, and he considered himself foremost as a craftsman. And uh, it's very inspiring how much of the pen that you see even in his tape work. Jan van Krimpen is another calligrapher who was inspired by Johnson's book when he was a student. And of course, he became like a great calligrapher of his own accord. And he was also inspired by the Italian writing masters. And he designed a lot of beautiful typefaces for, for Enschede. And you can see that he has a very elegant classical style that's happening here. Uh, William A. Viggins, um, his photo sort of makes me smile. <laughs> and he sort of seems like he would have also been like a fun person to hang around um, along with Gowdy. So one only imagines how fun it would have been um, <laughs> uh, when he was studying with Gowdy. So like he studied with Gowdy, but like he sort of went on to make a lot of different styles with different characters. And like he was good at everything. <laughs> he was good at illustration, type design, typography. Like he has a lot of funny quotes. Um, and here is uh, Metro, 
which was uh, designed as like almost like a bet. Like I think he had an article published where he was like sort of being like, oh, I wish there was a better sans serif out there. And like someone, um, maybe from Linotype, uh, yes, from Linotype was like, well, why don't you make one? Um, and then he, he did. And it was Metro and it was great. He also carved these like really realistic looking marionettes in his free time. Um, and there is a press release in 1937 that Guggins, um, uh, was introduced as a calligrapher, type designer, typographer, a technician in many untrodden ways of illustration and decoration, notable type designer, puppeteer, and an authority on puppeteer joints, manipulation, a thinker, and writer. Um, so he seems like a he seems like a character um, who is having a sort of a resurgence. Um, there's a new book that's on Wiggins. I highly recommend it. He seems like he was just full of all these ideas that he just like made into reality. And so we come to the very end of our lecture series, um, where we stop a little bit after World War II. And if I had to sort of do a little bit of self-reflection and self-criticism and um, like on this lecture series, it would be that like, um, there aren't that much, there, there really isn't that much diversity in terms of um, the things I've covered. And a part of it is that like a lot of the resources that I'm using don't have um, diversity reflected in their um, pieces and it's probably like as I said before like a combination of a uh, woman sort of being um, forgotten in their uh, lifetimes and sort of not being written down to history and perhaps um, they weren't credited enough um, historians maybe haven't uh, dug up uh, their names enough and um, so like I just wanted to put down like these two very excellent articles on alphabets uh, that was written by Indra Kuperschmidt and Elena Verguelas. This is um, more about like the woman in type history that, that deserved to be uh, remembered more. And I certainly would um, would welcome any uh, ideas or thoughts that you have um, on the lecture series. And of course, here is the lecture slides uh, that are available um, in high resolution on my website and the lecture bibliography as well, in case you want to check out a lot of these resources. Typographica is always like a great place to go if you're ever wondering um, what's hot in the world of type. Um, alphabets that I just mentioned, um, a lot of these uh, foundry blogs are always very helpful. Um, and yeah, uh, that is uh, the end of the lecture series for now. And I'm planning to sort of start a monthly newsletter with updates. So if you want them, please sign up on my website. And I teach a lot. Um, so I've started making a website that to compile all my students' work. So, like, if you are looking at this during the pandemic time, like, or later anytime, I suppose, like, please check out letterformdesign.com, where I'm compiling a lot of my students' work. Um, a lot of their contact information is there. If you ever want to hire them, say hi, uh, drop a little bit of a um, note to say how much you, you know, you love their work and so forth. Yes. So, uh, that's it for me, and thank you. I hope you enjoyed this um, armchair research and um, journey into the world of tech design and letters and lettering and all all, <laughs> all these great letter forms. Thank you.